Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the second Saturday of the month, which means it's time for Moving Medicine Forward with Dr. Michael Clapper and Dr. Zach Burns. And today they're going to be discussing whether or not ChatGPT knows more about dietary disease reversal than your doctor. Please welcome them back to the show. Hi, Dr. Clapper. Hi, Dr. Burns. How are you both today? Oh, we're just great. Hi, AJ. Great to see you and great to be with all your viewers today. Thanks for the invitation as always. And Dr. Burns, how are you? I just noticed you're going to be speaking at the Plantrition Conference in September. Yes, I was very excited about that. It'll be my first time there at Plantrition. And I'm going to be talking about medical training. At that point, I'll be just a few months out of residency. And so I'll be able to give people a timely perspective on how we're being trained. Um, there's some good things and some possibly deficient things when it comes to nutrition. That's exciting. Is this like your first major talk? You could say it. Yeah. I'm, well, I can, I mean, being on Chef AJ is, you know, that's my, that's <laughs> but you know, they, they, they get about 600 people to that event. Good. Yeah. It should be a good one. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Nice. Well, you know, ChatGPT, it's so interesting because before ChatGPT, most people went to Dr. Google for advice. Indeed. Well, this seems to be a step beyond Dr. Google, though. Though uh, uh, Dr. Google, I think, has done more good than harm. Uh, you know, it's easy to scare yourself if, if, uh, if you're using Dr. Google there. You type in a symptom and uh, and you get not only all the terrible possibilities, but then you get everybody else's comment. Oh, I my sister had that and she was dead in three months. And uh, you wind up scared silly there. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's best to run it past your physician. But I um, I don't get upset when people uh, can ask me about, uh, well, I read this on the Internet. Wonderful. I'm, I'm glad people are, are learning more about it. And, uh, and I think it's been generally useful. Um but along comes ChatGP, this remarkable entity um, that uh, uh, has this vast, vast pool of knowledge behind it. And a lot of it is is medical. And uh, it's hard to, uh, well, there's no question that uh, artificial intelligence, AI, is going to uh, revolutionize the practice of medicine. Well, we can talk about it. And a lot of it is really exciting. Now, someone's a little risky um, that, that we'll talk about. There are some hazards built into it. Uh, but I was amazed how, uh, I don't know, I dare say it, uh, pro-vegan uh, it was, uh, ChatGPT, when I typed in, how does a vegan diet reverse atherosclerosis? Um, uh, there wasn't a hint of negative. Oh, here's six ways uh, and what we could talk about them. Uh, here are six possible mechanisms. Uh, and 100% constructive. There wasn't the slightest negativity. This is a radical, unproven, not, not a hint of that. It, it, you asked it a straight question, gave you a straight answer. And uh, and I was pleased about that. And uh, well, we can talk about the fine tuning, about whether it hit all the points. And then I asked, how does a vegan diet reverse um, uh, type 2 diabetes? Zing, there's uh, seven ways, uh, there's seven mechanisms. And then finally, we I asked, how does it reverse autoimmune disease? And bloop, yeah, here's that. And uh, wow, uh, very impressive. Uh, there's some fine tuning that, that we can talk about, but uh, uh, but certainly not a uh, an, uh, an adversary in any way. I, I think it's going to be a very useful tool, uh, especially for folks in the plant based world. Yeah, uh, Dr. Burns, have you had any experience with it? What's your take on uh, on AI so far? First of all, just that it was these responses from ChatGPT on the topic of dietary disease reversal were really astounding. We'll get into them, but um, these were responses that most of our colleagues in medicine um, who were trained conventionally uh, would not be able to come up with. I mean, we're talking about it, you asked, you know, how does a whole food plant based diet uh, work on atherosclerosis? And it was responding with points about endothelial function. I mean, this is this is some advanced um, physiology that most of us just never learned. Like the only reason I was aware of those themes 
is from working with you and being in this lifestyle medicine movement. So it's really, I mean, it, it was really astounding. I will say, I mean, are you finding uh, with your patients that they're, that they're on ChatGPT themselves? Have they done some research before they come to you? Uh, not ChatGPT per se, but only because it's so new. Uh, and, and so many well, of the patients you and I deal with uh, the answer is going to be eat a whole food plant-based diet. Don't worry about the mechanism. Uh, you know, just do that and get yourself healthy. And uh, But those who you know, have an interest in, well, why does this work? How, you know, how can I fine tune this? Um, I'm, I'm sure I wouldn't hesitate at the, in the office or during the telemedicine interview to pull up chat TPT, uh, ask it the patient's question and share the, uh, and share the answer. And, uh, and I think that's going to be one of the greatest benefits of ChatGPT. It's never going to replace a human physician, and we can talk about why and and the the downside of um, of AI uh, in medical practice. Uh, but as a wise professor standing behind you, whispering in your ear, "Don't for you know this patient mentioned they just traveled to South America, then you better include this, 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 and this uh, in your list of possibilities uh, for diagnosis." Uh, and uh, you better order these tests. Um, th that's a, you know, boy, who wouldn't want that as a physician? So, because you hate to have the patient leave the office and, oh, I didn't ask him about the, you know, other medications they were taking or family history of allergies. Well, the chat GPT will remind you uh, to do that. And so I think it's going to really augment the power of, uh, of uh, the, the clinical practitioner there. So, um, so we're going to see more and more of it. Um, and there's a couple of, um, of uh, it's going to benefit both primary care doctors and the specialists. Uh, for primary care doctors, I mentioned, it's going to uh, increase the, uh, the, the power of the questions uh, when we're dealing with possible diagnoses and what tests to order. Uh, where they're talking about precision medicine these days, and uh, that's a new term that we got to deal with. And what it really means is um, uh, because people vary uh, by their, their weight, their sex, their past history, their, uh, their racial differences, uh, well, their diseases are going to manifest different and their treatments are going to uh, uh, be, uh, uh, be different. You've got to tailor uh, your testing and your treatments for that. Uh, and... Um, and that's where one of the hazards can come in as far as if there may be bias built in uh, uh, to the, the algorithm. If all the, um, the test data and the normal values were all derived out, off of a population of white men, uh, then if you have a uh, diminutive uh, Asian woman in front of you, the, uh, you know, her values are not going to be the same. You got to tailor uh, the... Uh, uh, you hope the the algorithm is you know, uh, understanding enough to uh, to overcome these biases there, and that's one possible hazard there. Uh, but it's certainly going to help the primary care doctor with with follow up, how uh, to remind the patient uh, you need to be seen uh, to uh, uh, to do follow up testing, etc. And nowadays, uh, with all these wearable devices. Uh, the the rings and the wrists wrist device etc. If that that goes right into the AI program, so when the doctor uh, tunes in the patient, uh, they can see right away. Here's what they've been running uh, for blood pressure and heart rate and blood sugars for the last uh, uh, the last uh, you know, interval of time there. Um, so it's certainly going to help primary care medicine. Uh, and the specialist is going to help the radiologist read MRI scans better and uh, CT scans better. The pathologist looking at slides of, of tumor tissue, et cetera. The AI uh, is going to be probably more precise in, in picking up very subtle uh, uh, diagnoses. Uh, and the dermatologists, I think, are going to welcome uh, the, the, uh, uh, the AI's help in diagnosing, especially with telemedicine, a patient holds up their uh, rash or a, or a skin lesion, uh, AI can probably do a really good job at diagnosing that. So, um, so it's definitely going to be changing medicine without question. But um, 
there there's some hazards built in as well. Uh, privacy concerns um, are an issue um, as the as your data gets uh, slung back and forth between various you know, from the insurance companies to the uh, uh, to other doctors. You know that's uh, uh, there's got to be concerns about that. And the um, and the last thing is. is um, uh, we got to be careful with the patients uh, not to uh, to gamify their their health situation. If your goal is to keep that blood sugar level, uh, if that becomes your goal there, then you and all you're eating is saturated fatty foods all day. Yeah, you keep your blood sugar nice and level, but you're not going to be helping your health with that. And so there's a there's an element of gamification that can sneak in uh, that. Uh, you know, that people need to be aware of there, but um, but by and large, I'm really looking forward to it. And getting back to our uh, our topic of the day, I think the uh, uh, the plant based physicians are going to learn a lot, and uh, and I, and I look forward to the AI being shaped uh, for vegan patients and vegan doctors uh, as far as the. The algorithms will have specific things to be looking for and reminding the patients about. Uh, there are a couple. There are a couple uh, of neat applications that yeah. my my co residents have already used, and they oh. told me about. I'm a little bit low tech, um, and by the way, this theme of ChatGPT was Dr. Clapper's idea, even though he was born a few years before me. But um, you know, I, it's so I don't personally have Chat ChatGPT or utilize it in my practice. But uh, some of my co-residents will use it for the following. So, you know, one of them wanted to, a patient asked about meal planning. How can I have more nutrient dense meals? Um, do you know anyone who could, you know, like provide a meal plan? Well, yeah, you can, you can find some through PCRM, um, through forks over knives, like these things exist. But what she did is she just said, all right, um, plant-based meal plan for two weeks, all different meals. Uh, and she put even put in some specific parameters and it just, you know, within seconds, ChatGPT pumped out a specific meal plan that she could just print out and give to the patient uh, without, you know, it, it might've taken some time to get in to see the dietitian, et cetera. That's a neat one. Another one that my friends have used is in patient friendly um, sort of medical communication. So say you have a lab abnormality and it's a little bit um a little bit obscure like it's not something we talk about you know say that i don't know the, the mean corpuscular volume was a little bit abnormal and you want to communicate that in a way that's intelligible um when you're not trained in medicine well they did that so okay um take this cbc and explain it in lay terms uh for the patient they just send that via the portal it's a really efficient use of it, but it, it raises some, you know, you really have to read through that. Like you don't just, don't just launch a, a paragraph explanation of the lab without really making sure that that's accurate because so, and the, you know, these are the potential downfalls of using AI because you just, and remember it's not, we have not achieved this artificial general intelligence at this point. And so all the information that it's pulling from is just human information that's on the internet. Like there's nothing else. Uh, and so things to keep in mind. Do you think a lot of people are using it? Because I, I, I mean, I don't have it. Like I, I've used it, for example, when people have asked me to write reviews for their books and, you know, to just try to make what I want to say better. But I, I don't even know how to get it. Like I don't have it on my phone or my computer. My husband bought something. But do you think the average person is it has it and is using it for medical advice? Oh, yeah. Just go to Google and type in ChatGPT. Oh, my gosh. The link will show and just click on it. And it's very user-friendly. Uh, it says, how can I help you? Type in your, it has a little search bar. Type type your question in. Speaks fluent English. You can talk to it conversationally. And it, and within seconds, it spins out these very uh, detailed answers that uh, were very, uh, they're, it knocked me back when I first saw it, uh, how, uh, how, how complete it was. <clears throat> But do, do most patients use it for medical advice? Maybe not. I mean, it depends on the population. So I work at a community health center 
where people are low income and they don't have as much technologic resource or understanding. And so, um, th no, they're not using chat. They're not even doing the Go the Dr. Google thing where they, but I've worked in other places, um, where, you know, sometimes the population is referred to as the worried well, and they, you know, they, they've spent a long time on the internet and they've also talked to their like four or five physician family members and they come to you with really specific, uh, questions and that that can be good it can also be detrimental because they're not the it just it can breed a lot of anxiety when you're getting medical advice outside the the, the, the um like to, to the medical exam room but i think increasingly people will use chat gpt for this sort of thing absolutely um yeah, but again, uh, the, another risk is that physicians get lazy and they just uh, they, uh, they don't read the answer thoroughly. They just uh, send it off to the patient. And as we all know, they, uh, the, uh, these AI programs can hallucinate. They can, fab can fabulate answers that don't make any, any sense. And um, so, the, again, it's got to be proofread by a, by a real life human. And there's also a liability question. What if there, if there's, um, if the ChatGPT makes a mistake in the dosage uh, or the strength of meso, who's who's at fault here? Uh, who gets sued? Who uh, uh, who uh, who covers that mistake there? Um, the, the designers of the algorithm, the doctor who used it, um, were you know this is new frontier stuff, um, but. Uh, but again, we're at the beginning. There's no stopping this. There's no putting the genie back in the bottle here. The, this is uh, going to permeate all of medicine without question. Uh, liability but, liability yeah. also comes up when you're when you're using images. So say you, you scan um, a skin lesion, and you know you want to, you want AI, some kind of AI program, to scour the internet and find all of the lesions that um, have you know that are like, have similar characteristics we wouldn't be able to identify it in that detail. Um, so it can be a powerful tool, but what if that program gets it wrong? I mean, who, who's that fault? There? I think I just, at this point, we really have to be using common sense. There's really no substitute for that. Uh, same thing in radiology. You know, they say that radiologists might be the, the first specialist to get it to become obsolete. We love our radiologist colleagues, but you know, these programs can look at a scan with such um, detail that it, it's, it, I think that AI will become really integral. It probably is already being utilized in that field. Yes, wow. go ahead. No, I was going to say, wow, radio, I, I don't know if Peter Rogers, Dr. Peter Rogers, whose show is tomorrow, I don't think he'd like to hear that very much. <laughs> or, or Dr. Barnett, we'll have to ask them how they right. feel about it. Indeed, how is you know, they're feeling about it? Um, it should just augment their you know, abilities. There, you just can't replace them. And uh, the, the human physician, somebody's got to take responsibility for saying yes. That scan is the way I would read it as well. Uh, but uh, the the uh, AI eye is uh, uh, probably a bit sharper than the radiologist, but still the interpretation is what matters. And uh, the patient's whole history, you know, when did this appear? It's more than just a spot on a film. It's uh, who is this person and what are what do they do for work? Uh, what kind of air have they been breathing? And if it's a chest x-ray or a chest scan or whatever, uh, you know, the human radiologist needs to, you know, it was what they do. They're a very underappreciated specialty, but they've got to be clinicians as well. And as they make that diagnosis. And so uh, they've got, the AI, is, it's a tool. It's a powerful one but uh, it's still not going to replace human physicians. <clears throat> but um, but another risk, of course, is that, uh, and it's happening today with the electronic medical records where you, you come into the, you know, you come for a doctor's appointment, you sit down, and there's a doctor typing into the to a computer screen uh, and uh, barely even looks over at you as you're, they're supposedly listening, but they're just typing and typing away and, and the personal interaction uh, between the doctor and the patient gets lost, uh, and that's a that's a real hazard there. You know, that's uh, we can't I can't lose that primary that primordial relationship of the physician and the uh, and the patient. So arguably, arguably AI could 
alleviate that because it's listening say the ai ear is listening and it can do some of your charting for you it could be a scribe it can populate some of your um note right and and then it, it frees you up to actually have more human interaction with the patient i don't know why i'm um <laughs> advocating for this thing i i do i, I am skeptical in a lot of ways but it, you know it has some interesting applications that way Yes, I was just listening to a Rich Roll podcast that he had, the head of uh, Stanford Medical School, uh, talking about AI. And and that word came up a couple of times, be skeptical. So whatever that AI tells you, have a little lens of skepticism. Well, maybe, okay, interesting, but not the final word there. It still resides with the physician. And uh, a little skepticism is, is important uh, in, in accepting the uh, conclusions. <laughs> But um, uh, getting back to uh, you know the, the the context of our, our talk today, this is a plant based uh, uh, discussion. Um, I uh, just for the fun of it, uh, after I got these answers, and by the way, the answers that um, that uh, uh, the ChatGPT gave me on uh, on how does a uh, whole food plant based diet improve type two diabetes? Uh, absolutely, weight loss, improve insulin sensitivity, reduced inflammation, gut microbiome health, uh, nutrient density, improve glycemic control. Fair enough. Uh, those are all valid uh, uh, mechanisms. Uh, not a word here about intramyocellular lipid um, or the um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the changes that happen uh, as you pull the fat out of the diet, uh, how that fat is metabolized, et cetera. You know, it didn't drill down, you know, in great detail, though if I asked a follow-up question, it might have done that. Uh, the same thing I asked, how does a whole food plant-based diet reverse atherosclerosis? Uh, lovely answers, improvement in blood pressure, anti-inflammatory effects, improve, enhanced endothelial function. Uh, didn't mention it improved... Uh, 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 the blood viscosity goes down. The blood is more free flowing. It didn't, didn't touch on that at all because the higher water content uh, of the foods, you know, it didn't hit all the bases, but it got the right uh, the right sense of it. Um, and um, and so just for the uh, uh, for the fun of it, I said, uh, how can we get the public to see vegan diets as positive for health and the planet? Uh, and boy, didn't hesitate. Uh, promoting the benefits of vegan diets for health and the planet requires a multifaceted approach that addresses both the practical concerns and misconceptions. Here are some strategies. And spit out uh, education, environmental awareness, uh, uh, culinary in uh, innovation, celebrity endorsements, pol policy support, community building, uh, marketing strategy, collaboration, uh, lead by example, and at the end, it said, by employing a combination of these strategies, we can help shift public perceptions of vegan diets from being seen as restricted or, or extreme to being recognized as positive choices for both personal health and the health of the planet. Well, good for you, Chad GPT. Uh, uh, I, was, uh, I was gratified to see that. And uh, so I would hope that uh, people, our, our viewers here, um, start using this to enhance their own personal efforts, whatever, if you're helping the animals or the planet or health, whatever, uh, use this spectacular tool. And it's free for the asking. It's free for the, free for the Googling. And uh, the, the, the classic chat GPT is free. They now have GPT-4, which costs you a few bucks a month. Uh, but uh, but the uh, but the basic uh, GPT is free for the uh, for the using, so uh, uh, new era is has dawned here. Dr. Clapper, so, have you ever asked Chat GPT what's the best way to lose weight? Hmm, no, I haven't. Uh, but why don't we just do that right now? Just I would love to here. know the answer. All right, fair enough. So, um, and should I? Um, so I ask you, utilizing a whole food plant-based diet or just wait? Maybe see, maybe see what it has to say in general first and then, okay. then All maybe right. ask. All right. What is the best uh, way to lose uh, weight? Okay. And it says with a three-second uh, delay there, 
Best way to lose weight can vary depending on individual factors such as age, gender, current weight, health status, lifestyle preferences. However, some general principles can guide uh, and nothing revolutionary here. I'll wait till it's uh, uh, spits, finished spitting out. Uh, one is healthy eating habits, focusing on a balanced diet, plenty of fruits, vegetables, lean proteins, whole grains, limit processed foods, sugary beverages, high calorie snacks, portion control is also essential, not really on a whole food plant-based diet. Um, as uh, consuming more calories than your body needs can lead to weight gain. Regular physical activity, behavioral changes, pay attention to your eating habits and behaviors, lifestyle modifications, get enough sleep, manage stress, avoid unhealthy habits like alcohol, cigarettes, seek professional guidance, work with a registered dietitian, nutritionist, or healthcare provider who can provide personalized recommendations and support, stay consistent and patient, weight loss takes time, it's essential to be patient and persistent, Focus on making small, sustainable changes to your lifestyle rather than seeking quick fixes or extreme measures. Celebrate your progress along the way. Be kind to yourself as you experience setbacks. In the last sentence, ultimately, the best approach to weight loss is one that fits your individual needs, preferences, and circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, it's essential to pr uh, prioritize overall health and well-being rather than solely focusing on the number on the scale. So, Good point, uh, but perhaps slightly generic right and they didn't even yeah. say watch jeff aj's show or read her books <laughs> right now mm -hmm. uh, so um how um best to lose weight um uh, uh utilizing um a whole food uh plant-based diet and see if that changes the answer at all Okay, uh, focus on whole foods, eat plenty of fruits and vegetables, incorporate whole grains, include protein-rich plant foods, uh, healthy fats in moderation, limit processed foods, stay hydrated, be mindful of portion size, plan and prepare meals, stay active. Yep, standard stuff, but it is, is what it is. Uh, uh, on I, the, go ahead. On the topic of lean proteins, right, when we ask this, you know, generally, how does one lose weight? Um, best, you know, the, you're the first question. They they talk about lean proteins, which seems to be the convention in you know mainstream medicine. Um, if anyone wants a little more perspective on lean animal proteins, our last episode was on the um, some issues surrounding chicken and fish. So just to uh, point to that, so that was our our last episode because it's really. This is, it's, it's a problem because doctors are routinely recommending um, basically white meat, um, chicken. It's, it, it's generally considered wise to reduce red meat, but people are saying eat as much chicken, turkey, and fish as you want. And it's really an insidious problem with our, with our recommendations. So something everyone should know. And then um, one thing that it, it did talk about sleep one of the last two questions, and I think that's really great. I actually noticed on the original questions about a whole food plant-based to prevent atherosclerosis or type two diabetes, it didn't mention sleep, but here's the thing. When you're eating a clean diet, uh, you're gonna sleep better. The quality and the duration can improve. And, uh, and that's really key. I a study just came out in JAMA uh, about sleep to reduce type 2 diabetes risk. Um, it was a massive prospective cohort study where people, they, 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 basically, if you're getting four or five hours of sleep, your risk of developing type 2 diabetes increase proportionally, you know, to how little you sleep. Um, and then they looked at diet and of course, they found um, a, like the healthier categories of diet were associated with the reduced risk of diabetes. But uh, they found that there was no additive effect between sleep and, and nutrition in decreasing diabetes risk. Okay, but the optimal diet in this particular study included fish. And so one wonders if it was a more exclusively plant-based diet, could that have an additive effect with sleep on reducing the incidence of, of diabetes because we see those kind of trends in other studies like Adventist Health Study 2 and, and such. 
Is there a question for me in that? Uh, I think the points you're raising are just excellent. And um, and the the specter of the chicken and fish being healthy is still stalking the land. And um, people really fall into that. And, uh, and well, how about just a little fish? Uh, uh, how little? You know, guppies? Minnows? You know, how, how, what kind of little fish are you talking about there? And... Uh, but you know we're we're clear cutting the oceans. We're strip mining the oceans at this point. You can't uh, ignore uh, you know if we don't have a healthy planet, a healthy ecosystem, uh, it doesn't matter what your weight or your cholesterol levels are. And uh, you know that needs to be uh, incorporated into our advice as well. It, it's not worth a uh, little fish is okay, not anymore. So agreed. And you mentioned uh, you mentioned what was on my mind. Um, the the um, intramyocellular lipids, right? So, so ChatGPT didn't get that far, but that's a really key part of the pathophysiology of insulin resistance in type two diabetes. Could you elaborate on what that is? Yes, uh, when people are eating a high fat diet, and despite most protestations. Uh, oh, I don't eat, I hardly eat any X, Y, Z. Most folks, uh, especially if they're eating the standard Western diet, uh, the, the bacon eggs for breakfast, the cheeseburgers for lunch, the chicken for dinner, the ice cream for dessert, uh, you're keeping your blood fatty hour after hour. And as the weeks and the months go by, uh, that fat starts oozing into your muscle cells and into your liver cells. It starts accumulating there. You can see it under the microscope, you see these black blobs in, in the cells there that does not belong there. This is fat in the muscle cells and in the liver cells. Uh, and they inhibit the enzymes that run the mechanism that when you eat, we eat sugars and the pancreas puts out insulin, uh, uh, the insulin molecule plugs into the receptor on the surface of uh, the muscle cells and the liver cells. And normally that activates enzymes, it pulls the, the glucose, the sugar into the cell where it can be burned. But if those enzymes are all gummed up uh, with the fat, with the intramyocellular lipid, uh, a big 50 cent word there, but um, uh, intra is inside, myo is muscle, cellular is in the cell, and lipid is fat, uh, so this is fat in the muscle cell. If those enzymes are all gummed up um, and inhibited by the fat in the muscle cells and the liver cells, uh, insulin molecule attaches to the surface of the cell to set off the uh, uh, the enzyme mechanism, but nobody answers the door, the call there. Uh, the enzymes are, are too gummed up to respond. So the sugar piles up in the blood uh, and people are walking out with high blood sugars, which has its own problem. But when people say, ooh, diabetes, oh, sugar, sugar, don't, you know, the problem is too much sugar. No, the sugars, the, the high sugars are the tail of the dog. Uh, the, the key is the fat that you're eating on a daily basis that's clogging you up. And so uh, uh, that's why, you know, the that rolls off our tongues now. A low fat, uh, whole food, plant-based diet, that low fat is important for this very reason. Uh, so uh, uh, again, is the fat driving the insulin resistance. And so once you have that insulin resistance, you can't get the dietary glucose into the cells. So if you have a high sugar, processed sugars, right? Soda, cakes, cookies, ice cream, that's just going to exacerbate the problem and you'll have hyperglycemia. But the important piece is that that was not really the origin of the problem. It was the standard Western high fat diet that, as you say, clogged up the insulin uh, receptors such that they cannot do their job and bring that glucose into the cells where they need it, where you could metabolize it and have a, a, a proper like, uh, um, glycemic response. Now, the other thing is that you mentioned the liver cells get clogged up as well. And when that happens, the sugar can't get inside those hepatocytes, the liver cells, and they perceive that they don't have enough sugar. So the response is that they they promote uh, gluconeogenesis, so making sugar from scratch, and that just so then you're pumping out more glucose into the body. It further exacerbates your high blood sugar, and the problem spirals. 
Yes, one of the main actions of insulin, it, it tells the liver, stop putting more sugar into the blood. It, it puts the brakes on the liver's uh, production of sugar. And uh, uh, if you, again, if those, uh, if the liver is all clogged up with fat, uh, it keeps pump, pumping out the sugar and, uh, and the poor pancreas has to put out more insulin uh, to try and keep up. And after a while, it exhausts the beta cells in the pancreas that are putting out the insulin. And the whole thing spirals into, into official diabetes there. And, uh, you know, uh, a million years ago, you know, our ancient foraging ancestors uh, uh, spent all day foraging for food. Calories were of, of prime importance. Uh, and uh, and the, they were mostly carbohydrates. Uh, we, they would dig up starchy roots and tubers. They, added, they would uh, harvest edible grasses and berries, etc. Fats were relative rarity um, in the native diet there. If they came upon nuts or um, avocados or their ancient you know, progenitors of avocados, uh, and of course, the animal fat, but even the animals back then were lean creatures, the antelopes and whatever, uh, wasn't much fat on them either. So fat was a uh, a real premium uh, in ancient times, and we were naturally running on low fat diets. Well, catapult us into the 21st century. Now fat is everywhere. And when you can eat from the egg yolks to the ice cream, you can eat fat all day and, and, it's, and it starts piling up in our tissues. And it's a real artifact of our modern life uh, that we're that we've created this insulin resistance. Our ancient ancestors never had to deal with that, and, but uh, again, we indulging in these fatty food tastes great on the tongue, uh, but boy, it sure causes a lot of mischief uh, once they get into our cells. On that subject, how does fat promote um, in a low-fat diet reverse atherosclerosis? Right. Well. Um, well, let me, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but as far as reversing diabetes, once you pull out the fats, once, once the only fats you're getting are from whole foods, not out of glass bottles or pouring olive oil on your, which will, will make uh, the problem worse. But if, but if you're, uh, the fats you're getting are from a few walnuts and some flax seeds on your cereal uh, and, uh, and some hemp seed, and that's about it. You know, it's a low fat diet. Uh, if you are, if your cells were already loaded up with that intramyelocellular lipid, uh, suddenly that steady flow of fat coming into the cells is gone, and the, the cells and your liver and your muscle say, "Hey, man, we uh, let, let's we we need to, what are we going to do for energy?" They look at, "Hey, we got this fat's already in our cells. Let's burn that," and that's what happens. The uh, the intramyelocellular lipid gets burned for energy. And and when that happens, that free that opens up the insulin receptors. And suddenly, you get normal blood sugars, and uh, we're back to our ancient physiology, where a little bit of glucose is easily dealt with and doesn't cause problems with high blood sugars, etc. So, yeah, so it's a reversible disease. You know, that's when we talk about reversing diabetes, we're talking about burning out that intramyocellular lipid and opening up the insulin receptors. And yay, the insulin resistance goes away. Yay. Um, and now with the atherosclerotic plaques uh, built up in the arteries there, um, a similar phenomenon, these plaques are um, full of oxidized cholesterol and the inflammatory cells that having that those the oxidized cholesterol particles in the artery wall sets off an inflammatory reaction. And that's largely what those plaques are. Well, when you, when you stop... Uh, the oxidized cholesterol, most of which is from cooking animal muscle, uh, the, the very act of grilling the burger and broiling the steak and frying the chicken uh, oxidizes the cholesterol in the animal's muscle. And so every time they eat that chicken breast or that burger, the flood of these oxidized cholesterol particles flood through the tissues uh, and they work their way into the walls of the arteries and set off the, uh, uh, the plaque formation. Well, uh, when uh, you take that away, stop doing that. You're eating rice and beans and greens. You know, steaming broccoli doesn't create oxidized cholesterol. Boiling rice doesn't create oxidized cholesterol. It's a uh, it's a gentle diet as far as the arteries go. Uh, and uh, when that happens, the uh, you you've stopped making the problem worse with every meal. 
and you're eating lots of colorful fruits and vegetables. And all the lovely salads and steamed veggies that are full of antioxidants that as the time goes by, seep into the walls of the arteries. They neutralize the free radicals. They damp down the inflammation. Uh, and the plaque uh, cholesterol starts getting absorbed. And you can see the plaques getting regressing. They get smaller and smaller. The arteries heal, uh, you know, and sprained ankles heal, cut skin heals, or inflamed arteries heal. If you, if you stop injuring them, the body knows how to do that. And uh, um, so, uh, you know, it's a remarkably reversible disease, unlike the cardiologists common belief, oh, the, once they get that angina, they are all going to need stents, they're all going to need bypasses. That's right, doctor. If you don't talk to them about changing their diet, that's what you're going to see. But it doesn't have to be that way. It's a reversible disease that we really need to get that message out to our colleagues as well as to the general public. Uh, we are plant-eating hominids. We need to honor that. And gorillas in the wild do not develop atherosclerosis. They're eating a high-carb diet all day of all the leaves and fruits and vegetation, and they don't develop clogged arteries. Duh, there's a message there for us. Uh, never seen a burger, uh, seeing a gorilla eating a cheeseburger there. And that's probably why they don't develop the diseases. So yesterday I was covering in the hospital. This month in residency, I'm working outpatient, but I was covering for a friend. And a patient comes in, we get a message, admit this patient, uh, you know, 70-ish year old, um, with with chest pain. And it turns out the patient had had a stroke seven years ago. Um, he fortunately didn't have any residual deficits. But, uh, you know, after that, he had a workup for, to check his carotid arteries, found the, the left side was quite clogged. He had a carotid end arterectomy. It's very, I mean, honestly, an incredible but high risk procedure to dig the plaque out of his carotid artery. Um, you have to cut off circulation to half your brain for a minute. Um, you, um, you know, during that procedure, the patient has an EEG on the, they're measuring the brain function um, to make sure that you, the lights don't go out to get, I mean, this is really high stakes, consequential stuff. Um, and of, of course, you know, he didn't have any particular genetic predisposition. These were the predictable consequences of, of a Western diet over the years and decades. And so he had this stroke. Um, he had the carotid end arterectomy. I asked him, did your, did your primary care doc, did your cardiologist, did they talk to you about nutrition or kind of what you should be eating at home? He said, well, not really. Um, Why I would just, they do a yeah. silly thing like that? <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. He said, well, yeah, they put me on a bunch of medications, but we didn't really talk about that stuff, um, referring to nutrition. So it's interesting because um, you'd be really a great candidate to make some um, sustainable lifestyle changes before this got worse. And unfortunately, it did. So he came to us yesterday. He was having angina. So if he walked a certain distance, his chest started to hurt. And he was already scheduled. It was a slower onset and he'd been to the cardiologist. He was already scheduled to have the cath where they go in through, you know, they, they, they you know, look at your coronary vasculature, the blood that supplies the heart itself to see if there's a blockage that's amenable to a stent, right? And he was due to have that, but they said, if, if your pain comes back, come in sooner. So, you know, now they'll probably expedite his his cath. And uh, it's just, you know, it, there's a portion of people who go in for this procedure and have a really bad outcome. I mean, they're in your coronary system and they're they're kind of wiggling around with the plaque. You can you can flake off a piece of plaque. And if it goes the wrong direction, you know, if it basically occludes one of the major coronary arteries, you induce ischemia and you know people sometimes can die during that procedure these are it's just a it's a huge deal and we really have an obligation to talk to these guys about um extremely low risk and um and like sort of fundamental changes that they can make beyond the 
meds and surgeries. But the on the bright side, the same hospital, right? We went around because we're working on uh, improving the dining options, making them healthier. We went around and talked to people about their preferences. And while not everyone had tried the plant-based options on the menu or not everyone was well versed in these things at home. Like it, right? It's a you know, it's a population that is kind of meat and potatoes. Many many of our patients there, and but at the same time, they were very receptive to we you know we would ask like if there was a healthier version of the burger or the bacon or the you know the sausage. We, some of these healthy whole food uh, options on the menu. Would you be interested? in trying them. Um, and the vast majority said, yeah, you know, of course. And, you know, some people who had tried the vegetarian options on the menu, and some are vegan, actually, they, they said, yeah, it was actually delicious. We said, would you try that at home? Would you continue, you know, eating that sort of style? They said, yeah. So you just, it, it reminded me, you never count out a patient uh, because of you know their age or their background or what you you know these assumptions we make about what people are willing to do we we have to give everyone the chance of proper counseling on lifestyle and just assume that people want to do what's best for their bodies because most most of them do so. Uh, he froze up for a minute. Oh, well, um, that's, yeah, just just some, not to count out the, the capacity of a patient to, to change their lifestyle. So, well, Zach, yeah, that. Dr. Burns, there is so much in that story. Uh, you encapsulated the entire, you know, what's wrong with Western medicine uh, is, is in that story. Um, uh, I'm well familiar with carotid endorectomies. When I used to do anesthesia, uh, we uh, did a, quite a number of those procedures. And when the surgeon clamps off the carotid artery so they can remove the plaque, um, I don't know, we watched the patient's blood pressure, um, but but my, our, but the anesthetist's blood pressure goes up, I'll tell you. And uh, my adrenal gland's going to work out until uh, they release that clamp. You know, it's as scary as you're uh, setting off blood flow to the brain. And so you put the patient at this great risk, and yeah, you pull the plaque out. But what have you done? You pulled what, one piece of plaque out of an important artery. But as you, you've implied, it's a total body disease. If you've got plaque in your carotid arteries, you've got it in your coronary arteries, as this man obviously had when his angina appeared. But you've got it in your renal arteries to your kidneys. You've got an ephemeral arteries going down to your legs. It's a total body disease. And this plaque's got to be melted away from the entire blood vessel system uh, day by day with a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, and uh, and yet the, the doctors are just honed in. Well, we, we put in a stent and we removed a plaque, the patient's cured. No doctor, the patient's not cured. And in fact, those arteries will continue to get worse if, you, if the patient doesn't change their diet. And so they're so focused in on this, you know, the one little procedure, um, they're missing the, the forest for the trees there. But on the good part, the fact that you've got vegetarian options on a hospital menu, that never used to happen. That is music to my ears. Um, how did that happen? Uh, did you have anything to do with that? I'm, I'm curious. But uh, uh, the fact that it's there is a very positive sign. And uh, um uh, and I, I hope that as you said, some of them are even vegan options. You know, there's a saying when uh, when the dog plays the violin, you know, don't criticize the quality of the playing. You know, the fact that he's playing it at all is amazing. Yeah? And the fact that the, they've got a vegan option on the hospital menu is is, is earth shaking, is wonderful. So I hope um, uh, the dietitians are on board with that and promoting it. And I hope it's uh, uh, being taught to the patients. So as you said, when they go home, uh, they continue a healthy plant-based diet. That's great news. In mm -hmm. that. Yeah, we have we have several vegan options now on the menu, and it just takes some nudging and persistence. I mean, what you say is that the current menu is not compatible with the nutritional literature, um, and we're you know it, doctors don't feel good about their patients having these options, right? It just doesn't feel like appropriate medicine. 
So that's the message that our dining task force has been pushing for um, since I've been in residency. And the dining team is is quite receptive. That you know they are somewhat wary of patient satisfaction. They have certain incentives to you know the pay, like they don't, they don't want to alienate the patients. Say you can't have anything. Um, but that we've made a, a lot of changes, and the patients are into it. It's just going to be more education for providers and patients on what these like you know what the options are and why they're important. But as far you know, our organization, Moving Medicine Forward, we're trying to get that message into the heads of the young, of the medical students and the young docs and the residents like you about plant-based nutrition can reverse these diseases. Uh, and uh, the, I detect a little glimmer of, of that, uh, the fact that the, uh, uh, the hospital menu has these uh, plant-based options. Um, uh, so uh, so have you been talking to your fellow residents and the medical students? Are, are you sensing a more openness uh, to plant-based nutrition in general or nutrition in general having any effect on these diseases, but plant-based nutrition in particular? Is it a topic that your colleagues are con conversing with on, it, on any level? Yeah, I have to say in my program, I'm perhaps the most passionate about, about this topic. But there are a lot of people who share an interest, especially in lifestyle medicine more broadly. And, you know, at, at Brown, the, at the medical school here, there's a, one of those lifestyle medicine interest groups. And that's one of over 150 of these LMIGs across the country where they're taking time out of a busy med student schedule to, to learn about lifestyle medicine because they've realized that it is, it is the only way that we have a chance at tackling chronic disease. They, the, the third year students go on the wards and they see that pretty much, you know, at least eight out of 10 patients on a given hospital hallway are there because of what they've been eating or sometimes drinking or smoking. We, I mean, it's, it's not just about the new sexy, you know, biologic medication or, you know, advanced procedure. It's, it's about the, the basics. So people are, are getting that. And I think there's a lot of enthusiasm. And then there's also the, the ACLM's um, residency curriculum that they're, they're building into residency programs. And there, I think there are over 300 of uh, residency programs that have incorporated that. It's a really good sign that residents are hungry for, for this information so they can really do well by their patients. Oh, that's really great news to hear. Uh, AJ, we've used up a good chunk of the hour here. I don't want to uh, step on your time. No, just, this, I just, I love that you guys are having a conversation. I will say this is not on the subject of chat GPT, but occasionally viewers knowing that you're going to be on send in a question specifically for both of you. So if you wouldn't mind answering it, it would be sure. wonderful. Uh, I, this is from Joanne. She says, I have a question for Dr. Clapper and Dr. Burns. My brother is 75 and has steadily worsening vertigo that is getting serious enough that he's worried about being able to live independently. It's worse going from sitting to standing or bending over. He's seen his GP, has had every conceivable blood test and two MRIs, but nothing was found to explain it. He did have severe vertigo when he had COVID previously. Despite my urging, he eats standard food and won't even consider whole food plant-based. I've researched vertigo and there isn't much information online. Any suggestion? Greatly appreciated. Maybe we could ask ChatGPT. <laughs> Whoa, well, uh, I will do that, but I certainly have some um, uh, some thoughts about that. Uh, Dr. Burns, you want to have the first shot at it? And I'll, I'll follow up on that while I'm talking to GPT here. Sure. Yeah, the, the important thing is that, um, two important things. One is that, you know, without knowing all the details of the case, we can't really recommend anything in particular, but we can give some general advice. And uh, and the second thing is I'm glad, you know, that he had an MRI. Basically, that what that does is it rules out any actual mass or space-occupying lesion in the brain itself that could cause these symptoms. And it sounds like the MRI was clean, and that's really important. With vertigo, um, if you really have to characterize it. Sometimes it seems like vertigo, but it's 
something it's it's a it's a different kind of dizziness if it is vertigo the most common type is benign positional vertigo and um that's you know so a question for him would be you know if he moves from sitting to standing or if he turns his head does it trigger the symptoms um and for that you know there, there are different things we do there's some physical maneuvers that your doctor can can help you with to, that basically resets the inner ear and then there's the antihistamine meclizine um, is something that we commonly use for that type of vertigo but we'd really need a bit more information um agreed um uh, the most common uh, cause, as Dr. Burns said, uh, we have little crystals in our ear uh, balance mechanism that can break loose. And, uh, and as the person changes position, uh, these little broken off crystals rattle around uh, in the balance mechanism and send all messages to the brain that uh, uh, the world is spinning around there. Uh, there are maneuvers, the Epley maneuvers and others, uh, uh, that uh, can help reposition these little crystals. If you go on YouTube and type in uh, uh, home maneuvers for uh, for positional vertigo, uh, there's an ear, nose, and throat physician, a lady doctor, who, who gives you uh, how to do this, uh, sitting in a chair, bend forward, turn your head, uh, and hold in that position, then uh, uh, get down on your knees. There's a way, there's, and, and you're repositioning these crystals there. So check out the YouTube's uh, uh, maneuvers that he can do on his own uh, at uh, uh, on, uh, benign positional vertigo. But also, uh, we're talking about nutrition, the balance mechanism in the inner ear is fed by the cochlear artery, which is a tiny, tiny little artery. Uh, and if there's any plaque in that artery, if the, uh, if his uh, cochlea uh, and balance mechanism, the utricles there are short of blood flow, uh, that can certainly do this as well. Uh, and uh, again, get surprise, surprise, we were talking about opening up arteries uh, with a whole food plant-based diet well that's one artery you want to open up your the cochlear artery so um so i don't know how uh, uh amenable he is to changing his diet and you can't make any promises just uh, eat rice and beans and tofu and your it'll bph will your uh, bpv will go away magically but it's, it's a factor you should certainly take care of his arteries uh, with a whole food plant-based diet and uh, and check out these videos about repositioning the uh the crystals in the utricle there and uh, hopefully he'll get some relief. Another piece is that some people with vertigo or even other vague symptoms like this, um, you got to look at their medication list because as we know, you know, people who are eating a standard diet and um, worked up in the standard way are often on, you know, a dozen or more medications and even one alone, especially the interactions between the meds, can precipitate these kinds of just dizzy, you know, how many people are over treated with their antihypertensives and their SGLT2 inhibitors, they're lowering the blood pressure um, in and in, in stacking that effect. And, you know, so is it that he gets up and, and feels lightheaded and, and, you know, he's calling it vertigo. You just, you know, you want someone to really analyze the medication list to make sure we're not doing this, um, with our with our potions and pills. Well said. We we, we docs can do that on a regular basis. Polypharmacy is a, a risk. Go ahead, AJ. Well, what I was going to say, what I find interesting about well, it's two things about this question. One said, well, he's not interested in changing his diet, which I always find it's interesting when some people say, even if it will help, I'm not interested. So they want something else. But you know, I've been doing this show. I have, you're, I'm almost at episode 2000 now. And most of the guests have been doctors. And so many of the questions that come in is, will whole food plant-based help this? And then, so I, I keep thinking like, even like the people will have, not everything, you know, will be helped by whole food plant-based. You know, you fall down, you get hit by a truck. No, the, the, I mean, the diet will help you heal. But, but I find it curious that some people will only change if their particular disease will be helped. I mean, there's all these other diseases we know for sure will be uh, reversed or prevented, but if this particular one has been, I'll keep eating steak, you know what I mean? Uh, Homo sapiens, strange species. Uh, that, uh... Uh, health is right in front of them on their dinner plates, and oh, that's the one thing they don't want to change. And so, uh, thanks, I'll take my disease. Thank you, pa pass the steak. Uh, we're strange species. I've, 
I haven't had any gorillas in the office saying, you know, I can't keep my hands off the cheeseburgers there. They, they know what to eat. <laughs> we have yet to, to learn the lesson. I, I heard a story once of a, uh, like it was, it was an animal that was used in like to, for a guy to make money. It was a primate and he basically fed him McDonald's and, and this primate got atherosclerotic disease. They from certainly do. Uh, gorillas, yeah. in the, uh, gorillas in the wild do not develop clogged arteries, but the, that's what kills the gorillas in the zoos is they uh, they absolutely develop atherosclerosis and they have heart attacks and strokes uh, from the, the meat and the cheese and whatever else is in their gorilla mix, uh, gorilla food mix there. Uh, absolutely. Uh, there's a lesson uh, everything you need to know is right in, in that anecdote. Um, and well, my friend, uh, my friend, Dr. Musial says there are three species that can become overweight. I know what they you are. Know, you got it. Humans Go and their domesticated dogs and their domesticated cats. Right. And Not eating the guy. No other Old species stuff. will <laughs> will will do that because they're not eating processed food. Yeah. Absolutely. That's the only three species that really do eat processed food. Yeah. Really? I've never seen an obese giraffe, never seen an obese antelope. Right. Oh my God. I fed a giraffe once and boy, their tongues are like, <laughs> I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. It's just, well, you, you've been, it's, I, I love your combination. Cause like Dr. Clapper, you've been doing this longer than just about any other plant-based doctor and you're kind of new Dr. Burns, not, not, not necessarily, but you're kind of new being a doctor and you're new being plant-based, but you both have like such similar passions. Mm -hmm. We're a good uh, team. We're a team, all three of us here. We so Clapper great. and Burns, yeah. it's could be all right. a comedy. Take <laughs> it on the road. Uh, uh, we're opening in Peoria next week. Um, but um, uh, but it's great that you offer this platform to, to get this information out uh, to your viewers. And so you're an integral part of the team here. So well, thank you. Thank you. We, we hope that people will will take, you know, I can give the message, but they, they got it. I, I don't know. You know, I, I, I think this is just me. I'm not a doctor, but but food addiction is underdiagnosed and under. I mean, a lot of the doctors on this show don't believe in it, because if that wasn't a thing, why wouldn't people change? Why? I, with all the evidence, well, I can never give up my cheeseburgers or whatever. What other mechanism could there be? for people to rather die than switch. Yeah, you, I was skeptical because, you know, if I don't eat, you know, a particular food, I can't say I go through withdrawal symptoms. Uh, and uh, and so I was skeptical about it. But then the more I read the, uh, the neurophysiology literature uh, and I see these functional MRI scans uh, where uh, when you have someone with a real food issue, and you put them in the MRI scanner and you show them a picture of the cheeseburger, you know, the part of their brain lights up is the same one that the heroin addicts uh, have uh, uh, when uh, when they uh, look at uh, their next drug fix. And um, and so I have to begrudgingly admit, yeah, I guess that's uh, on a neurophysiologic level that qualifies as an addiction. The, the brain is responding the same way. And in that way, I can kind of understand the, the answer to your question. Well, why why won't they give up their cheeseburger? Because that feeling of the, of the initially lighting up that pleasure center is so powerful. And uh, and the taste of that cheeseburger does it. They, you know, that's what they really start craving. And it's, a, it's quite a challenge for both the, the person and their, and their healthcare practitioner. It's too bad people don't know that they could get to the other side because I've been to True North at the same time as both of you. And it, it, I mean, people think like we eat such an austere or draconian diet of like, yeah, I don't know, bean sprouts. The food's amazing that we eat, but we we they just haven't gotten to the point where it tastes good to them. Really? Right. Really. I remember, you know, the fear before I went fully plant based, like, will this be such a big sacrifice in my quality of life. It sounds silly now, um, but th I that really held me back. But like for a couple of years after I knew that I should be vegan, it held me, I was like, without pizza and ice cream, is life worth living? You know, it sounds absolutely ridiculous. Um, but I think this is a real fear that people have before they realize how delicious plant-based lifestyle is. But, you know, it's I, I think behavior change is partly individual and partly social and sort of economic factors. I mean, why are people eating this way? Because of advertising, um, because of tradition. So it, like, 
if as long as we have ads for junk and fast food bombarding us on TV and on social media, and as long as we have the billboards and the fast food restaurants on every block, it's you know it it, it there's an individual aspect, but it's it's going to trigger those cravings because we're, we're just inundated with messaging about eating the next animal protein hypercaloric product. So, you know, and it, it's, so that I think we have to tackle it structurally as well. I was just looking at, um, at some of the major medical societies and who their biggest donors are. All right. They're, they're usually the pharmaceutical companies and the device companies. This is the American Diabetes Association, the American College of Cardiology, Okay, American Heart. So, you know, is it any wonder that the guidelines that are produced by these esteemed medical societies um, have, a, you know, they're they're really talking about medications, um, and that's what they're focused on, right? And then it percolates into medical training, and that's what doctors focus on is drugs, and especially the latest and greatest. Um, the American Cancer Society. Uh, one of their corporate sponsors is Outback Steakhouse, right? Um, Hormel Foods, the maker of Spam, also contributes regularly to the American Cancer Society. So <laughs> we just we need this contact. We have to understand the economics of healthcare um, because chronic disease is an industry, right? And so we can't we can't let ourselves be, get taken advantage of like this, right? Um, it is, we, we have with, with the, this kind of program and, you know, with education and, and having conversations, we can overcome the, the impact of, of, of our, you know, of like basically the, these corporate part, partnerships that influence healthcare the most. Um, I, I think there's a very valid point. Um, uh, going back to the uh, the way the brain lights up with the cues for the uh, uh, for the food, the addictive uh, food. Uh, I had a patient who was um, who had been a person uh, who really had a strong addiction to uh, uh, various drugs, uh, and uh, but was now struggling with their weight. And they said, uh, "He said, Dr. Clapper, if if someone is really uh, addicted to uh, to drugs and." Uh, and you drive down the street, and the signs in the windows and hanging down from the uh, uh, from the stores uh, were heroin here and methamphetamine and cocaine. Uh, you know that poor person would really be pulled and drawn uh, by the temptation. But you have someone who, uh, because their brain lights up with the very thought of that word there. But if someone's addicted to foods, uh, you're driving down the road. What do you see? Uh, burgers, pizza, chicken. You know, it's, it's a similar phenomenon. And as you say, the society is really structured uh, to keep the, that association going. And, you know, and and parents, you know, they don't know. They they feed their kids what the what their parents fed them, and the. Uh, and you grow up eating these comfort foods, and then the neural patterning gets set in early on, uh, and uh, and then society, as you say, keeps it going uh, every day because a lot of people making a lot of money off both the food and the diseases they create, and we got to, the individual has to break through that and see the the truth. You know, the uh, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed person is, is the king there. And, <laughs> and open both your eyes and eat plants. That's what we're here to do. I love it, guys. Thank you so much, both of you, for taking the time. I know you both very, very busy doctors on opposite parts of the world. How are things going in your new country, Dr. Clapper? Do you enjoy them? Oh, I'm really excited about joining the staff. Um, the, the, I'm joining uh, the Aroga Health, uh, the Aroga Lifestyle Medicine Clinic up in Victoria, BC. Uh, and it's fascinating. And the main draw that, for me there uh, is that uh, in, in the United States, uh, the insurance companies basically pay the doctors. You bill Blue Cross and uh, uh, Aetna and you get whatever they pay you. Uh, but one thing that the insurance companies don't pay for are dietitians. Uh, the, the, the dietitian is held at arm's length and not really brought into the primary care treatment team. Uh, and because the insurance company is making money off of every stent and every bypass, there's no incentive for them to get their patients healthy. 
uh, in Canada, the go the government is paying the shot for the health care, uh, and they are interested in getting their pe people healthy. And uh, so they pay for dietitians. They know the importance of uh, of healthy eating. And at uh, the Aroga Clinic, um, the uh, the flow of patients, uh, the patient gets referred in by their GP. They see the physician at Aroga. And the very next stop that everybody has to go through is the plant-based dietitian. And he or she gives the patient uh, a plant-based dietary program. The, and only then are they referred on to the physiotherapist, whatever. And then the patient is seen on a regular basis by both the primary care doctor and the dietitian every month. They come in and if necessary, they're assigned a health coach. Uh, but they really wanted their very pro-plant based uh, eating there. Uh, and uh, and it's going to be so exciting. What I want to do is follow. I'm the director of telemedicine services for them. So I because a lot of the follow up is done through telemedicine. I want to keep track of the people who go through this program and document their health improvements, their weight loss, their blood pressure, their medication. Uh, and when we get enough data, come back to, to and start appearing at the American medical meetings at the AMA and uh, uh, the ACLM and, uh, and various uh, medical organizations saying, this is what they're doing in Canada and it's working. Get the dietitian on the primary care team and you'll get your patients healthier through disease reversal through plant-based nutrition. And I want to make it, I want to build the pressure up so there's, there's no choice. They're going to have to change the reimbursement and start uh, start paying for dietitians and plant-based dietitians, not the ones spouting the usual meat and dairy line there. And so uh, so the, I'm really excited about this new chapter that's opening up for me that I will hope bring back to the States uh, to uh, help, help the American system uh, get on board in the 21st century. Uh, I'm just up in Victoria, just over, you know, just north of Seattle. It's not like I've gone to the moon. And I'm still doing our... Uh, uh, I'm still doing our Moving Medicine Forward talks through Zoom and through uh, uh, live presentations. Uh, MMF is uh, is rolling on, and it's so great to have Dr. Burns on the team because uh, uh, he's doing great work where he is, and eventually he'll we'll pass the torch officially to him. But right now, it's uh, great teamwork that I'm really enjoying. But you're used to living in the desert in Florida, in Hawaii. It's not too cold for you in Canada? It's well, the, the Victoria's known as the banana belt of, of Canada. So it doesn't get terribly cold like Calgary or Toronto, but it's chilly. And uh, my wife, Elise, she's a warm weather girl and she's being a good sport. She's uh, she's uh, uh, really enjoying uh, being in Victoria. It's a lovely small city with a symphony orchestra and film festivals. And it's a very pleasant place to live. And uh, so she's uh, being a real trooper and uh, we're both really enjoying the transition. So, you know, I promise if it gets really cold, we'll send her to uh, Puerto Vallarta for a few weeks. We'll, we'll get her into warm weather uh, if uh, if she wants to get out of the cold. So fair enough. Nice. Where, where do you live, Dr. Burns, if I may ask? Yeah, I'm in Providence, Rhode Island for residency. But when I graduate, I'm going to take a job in Rochester, New York. So I'm also venturing into the tundra um, but, you know, I'm excited because the winters have been so mild. I grew up in New England and with climate, it's just lame, um, these winters. So I could use some more snow, get out in the woods, go cross-country skiing. I'm looking forward to that. Are you going to be working like with Dr. Ted Barnett? Not directly, but it's going to be great to be in his um, in his neighborhood. That's great. Well, thank you. Oh. It's interesting, by the way, I asked, mentioned Dr. Barnett. I asked him about uh, working with... Um, uh, with Dr. Burns, etc. And he said, you know, ten, five, 10 years ago, uh, absolutely. But he says, we're now global. It's not even localized into Rochester anymore. So many of our members and supporters live all over the world, literally, and all over America, that it's, it's, it doesn't matter where you live anymore. So it's less Rochester-centric. And uh, uh, I, just, I think it's a very positive sign. So yeah, that's mm -hmm. one reason why uh, Dr. Burns will uh, uh, be in his own orbit there. So, well, thank you both. It's always a pleasure talking to you. And thanks to all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Life. If you'd like to support the work of Dr. Clapper and Dr. Burns, Moving Medicine Forward is a nonprofit, 501c3. The link to donate is below. And please come back tomorrow for Dr. Peter Rogers. He is going to be talking about Western abdominal diseases. Take care, everyone. Bye.